Chicago Typewriter, or GI Trench Sweeper. Those are the two flavors of the Tommy gun that we're used to seeing when it comes to the Thompson's depiction in pop culture. This 100-year-old iconic American submachine gun has lent itself to both heroes and villains. From the front lines of the Second World War or in the hands of gangsters as it made the 20s roar. But for all of its legacy, it can often struggle to stand out in video games. I'm here at the Royal Armouries Museum to learn more about the Thompson's history, see the Tommy gun in action, and explore the pop culture legacy that this weapon has built after a century of history and over two decades as a gaming icon. You know what this is? This is a Chicago typewriter. Keep the change, you filthy animal. The Thompson has had somewhat of a peculiar history in the 100 or so years since it was first created, and that history has undeniably had a huge impact on the weapon's place in pop culture. But while most think of the weapon as an SMG of the Second World War, it was actually invented decades earlier by United States Army Brigadier General John T. Thompson in 1918 with the hopes that this 45 ACP automatic SMG would be the trench broom to break the stalemate of World War I. Between 1917 and 1918, there were two early prototypes of the Thompson, the belt-fed Persuader and the Annihilator. While in reality, the war would end before either model saw combat, the Annihilator prototype was immortalized in the virtual First World War of Battlefield 1. The Annihilator was the first in a long line of imposing titles assigned to the weapon, but the name wasn't exactly suitable for a weapon during peacetime. So by 1921, when the first major production models were being produced, the weapon officially became the Thompson submachine gun. And it's these notorious early years of the Thompson's life that have influenced much of the weapon's split legacy. While it was available to civilians at its initial price of $200, about $3,400 today, that high price point meant that it initially saw poor sales. Regardless, it soon became a popular choice of the gangsters that were profiteering from the era of prohibition across America's Roaring Twenties. It was a tool of intimidation and a status symbol for those to whom money was no object, with those same individuals willing to steal or lethally defend their lucrative illegal interests from rivals and lawmen. The Thompson, Tommy Gun, or Chicago typewriter as it came to be known, quickly began to gain infamy as the gun of a gangster. It's perhaps best known, certainly in the 30s, when the Americans and the American and British ar uh, armies are looking at it, it's, it's known as a gangster's weapon. Literally, we called it a gangster gun and looked down our, our British noses at it. We don't need that. Of course, it turned out we really did need that. And that's because of the 1930s, the Prohibition era. Babyface Nelson, Dillinger, a number of these gangs absolutely loved this thing. It's compact, it's heavy, but drive around in souped up cars and then you don't have to worry about the weight. And you can deliver a 50 round drum, a 100 round drum of 45 ACP into an uh, enemy car or uh, uh, other gangs mainly. A lot of gun crime comes about because of drugs or in this case, alcohol. So alcohol has been prohibited. These gangs are running alcohol to enforce and protect and intimidate. They're using these weapons. So much as it becomes a terror weapon for the provisional IRA in, in, in Northern Ireland, it's sort of a terror weapon for the gangsters as well. Films depicting this iconic period of history proliferated in the decade that followed. And the Thompson can be seen in early movies like 1931's Little Caesar, the weapon's first film appearance, and the 1932 version of Scarface. Get out of my way, Johnny, I'm gonna spit! As well as more recent gangster epics like The Untouchables and Public Enemies. Video games have not shied away from the weapon's criminal connotations either. The iconic silhouette of a drum magazine and a foregrip changes the weapon from just a Thompson to a so-called Chicago typewriter, making it easily recognizable even in early titles like the 1987 Gangster Town on the Sega Master System or as a firearm of virtual villainy in 2006's The Godfather and across the Mafia franchise. It's also a perfect weapon for the world of Bioshock, with the real-world M1921 Thompson being an expensive weapon of the Art Deco era, it's no surprise that Dieselpunk-styled versions found their way into Rapture's halls of wealth and excess. He was a but as we found out from a little range time, the 50 and 100 round drums make the pre-World War II variants of the Thompson massive, awkward, and very heavy, even more so when they're packed with 45 ACP ammunition. 
So with that in mind, it actually makes a lot of sense why games and movies will depict gangsters shooting this beast from the hip with long bursts of sustained fire. The drum's weight and size also made it harder to carry multiple magazines and reload efficiently, and would frequently cause the weapon to jam. But these were more military considerations rather than problems for the gang members of the 20s and 30s who favoured intimidation, hit and run tactics, and may have needed all 100 rounds just to punch through steel vehicles or a speakeasy's bar. It's hard to picture a 20s era Tommy gun without a criminal association or a user dressed up in a sharp suit and fedora. Even Resident Evil 4 has a nod to its movie tropes and noir Hollywood aesthetic, as when Leon wields the infinite ammo Chicago typewriter in the unlockable Mafia outfit, our hero could be seen striking a stylish pose in place of reloading. God damn. That was almost a pancake. There are also games from a more modern criminal's perspective that still tip their hat to this period of the Thompson's history, with GTA 5 and Payday 2 having the Gusenberg and Chicago typewriters, respectively. The name of GTA 5's Gusenberg Sweeper is interesting as it's a reference to Frank Gusenberg, a contract killer and victim of the 1928 St. Valentine's Day Massacre. A nod to the destructive power we're used to seeing from the Tommy Gun's pop culture depictions, but also the real world chaos and destruction that the Thompson wreaked across its early history. So wherever the Thompson ends up, it's a, a bloody mess of an aftermath, essentially. The Van St. Valentine's Day Massacre, pictures published in the papers at the time of, of guys just laid waste by ostensibly the Tommy gun. There are other weapons involved that are just as effective in their own way. But the thing that catches the public imagination and partly leads to the National Firearms Act of 1934 in the US is this, this Thompson gun. As much as Colt, who are making them at this point, are trying to market them to law enforcement and to the military, and they're legit, they're on the level, they're for the good guys, uh, it's too late. Everyone identifies them on some level with the gangsters. Put your mitts up. The other half of the Thompson's life is, of course, as the iconic American submachine gun, seen in the hands of the real heroes of World War II and the squad leaders charging alongside their troops up the beaches of Normandy in both cinematic and virtual representations of D-Day. As the Second World War progressed, the weapon got its share of frontline experience in the hands of the US military, British commandos and other allies, which led to the creation of the Thompson M1 and M1A1, the weapon most commonly seen in World War II movies and video games. The drum magazines were criticised in particular as they were heavy and tended to rattle, which didn't exactly make them ideal for any sneaky beaky activities. The M1 had a lower fire rate, it was cheaper to produce, lacked the cooling fins on the barrel, moved the charging handle onto the side of the receiver, simplified its iron sights, ditched the wooden foregrip, and could now only use the 20 or 30 round stick magazines. And it's this variant that becomes our iconic image in the hands of the American GI throughout the Second World War. Both the 1928 and M1 variants saw combat across the theatres of World War II, but with either in mind, the shape of a stick magazine and a flat foregrip instantly changes its silhouette from that of a gangster gun to an SMG of the American GIs. The image of an American soldier with a Thompson has proliferated through pop culture since the Second World War. It's almost impossible to imagine a World War II piece of media without the weapon, especially when it includes American troops. Whether it's Captain Miller's firearm of choice in the incredible Saving Private Ryan, battling through forests in one of its earliest gaming depictions in 1999's Medal of Honor, carried by members of Easy Company in Band of Brothers, or as one of the most prominent and recognisable firearms throughout the Call of Duty franchise. The Thompson has lent its incredible legacy to World War II pop culture for decades. The Thompson's automatic fire and focus on close quarters fighting adds an element of action and spectacle to games, movies and TV shows that the rifles of the time simply wouldn't be able to provide. This has meant that pop culture has showcased the weapon in such numbers that many have been led to believe that it was a much more common sight on the front lines than may have actually been the case. So as much as you will see in photos, in video footage, you will see US Army guys with Thompsons for sure. In the general, in the bigger scheme of things, the bigger picture, the Thompsons not as common as we would be led to believe, certainly from video games. There are a lot more M1 carbines out there, a lot more squad, squad leaders are mainly using uh, Garin rifles, and then the M3 grease gun replaces the Thompson from, from 43 onwards. So the Thompson's an important weapon, especially in the US Marine Corps, but it's not everywhere. It's not like you could just optionally grab a Thompson and go to war with it. 
1944 Table of Organization and Equipment states that an infantry rifle company of 193 men were issued only six submachine guns, which could then be requisitioned or distributed as the company commander saw fit. While that doesn't sound like a lot of Thompsons to go around, it is worth noting that over 1.3 million M1 and M1A Thompsons were produced. However, there were also more than 5 million M1 Garands, 6.1 million M1 Carbines, over 600,000 M3 Grease Guns, as well as other weapons. So pop culture may be a bit guilty of showing off the Thompson in more numbers than is actually realistic, but considering how recognisable the weapon is and the drama it can bring to a story or experience, I don't think that's a bad thing. The Thompson has been a key weapon in both the Battlefield and Call of Duty franchises from the very beginning. But since their first appearances back in the early 2000s, it's interesting to see how different trends and tastes within those franchises have impacted the humble Tommy gun. When Battlefield and Call of Duty once more explored the setting of World War II in Battlefield 5 and Call of Duty Vanguard, Battlefield 5 featured a fairly authentic M1928A1, while Vanguard's gunsmith feature allowed players to customise their M1A1s to better fit their playstyle or into cursed machinations like this. Wolfenstein The New Order features an interesting alternate history version of the Thompson, although while in reality the 45 ACP cartridge was supposed to pack more punch than the other SMGs of World War II, in Wolfenstein, where the Allies are unfortunately losing, the weapon instead struggles against the armaments of the enemy. However, in more grounded historical titles like Hell That Loose, automatic fire isn't as common, which means that the Thompson is better positioned to tap into its real historic role and use, while also feeling unique among other submachine guns of the setting like the Sten MP40 or PPSH-41. In general, the Thompson's portrayal across World War II pop culture follows the Sinner to Saint story of the real firearm. For all intents and purposes, the US military's M1 was a different beast than the gangster gun that preceded it, becoming what designer John T. Thompson intended it to be, a gun for the good guys. So where does that leave the Thompson in pop culture? Is it the weapon of a hero or a villain? The quintessential gangster gun or an SMG for the brave GIs and good guys? Honestly, I think it's both. The unique story of the Thompson submachine gun and its many variants means it can exist within multiple pop culture realms, bringing something different to each setting and story it finds itself in, without losing any of the impact that the weapon's presence or legacy provides. So if we do, if we do see it as the two main variants, the 1921 or the 28, with big old dinner plate mag and a, and a, and a foregrip, somehow that's kind of fedoras and pinstripes, and then the military, the, the strictly military variant, the M1 variant, as much more, you know, M1 helmet and fatigues. It's really a function of, of time. You know, the, the gun evolved over time to become cheaper to make, but also more practical. So that big chunky drum mag, drum mags are just not reliable, they're clockwork. And any dent and the thing stops working. We actually had that in the shooting that we were doing for this very series. Oh, that is a stoppage. So for all those reasons, the military gravitates toward the, the, the box magazine, the stick magazine, and that immediately changes the gun. So that for me, that's how it breaks down. It's a cha change over time based on practical requirements, turning it from massive capacity trench broom slash spray a room full of gangsters to something much more practical for the military side of things. Naturally, the weapon's implementation in games can vary widely, and it's common for games to mash up the details and features of the Thompson's many variants. If you want to know what Thompson you're using in a game, there are a few details you can look out for, with the most obvious being the charging handle. If it's on the side of the weapon, then the game is basing their Tommy gun on the M1 or M1A1, while if it's on the top, then you've got yourself an earlier model. One of the most common mistakes you'll see games making is fitting a drum magazine on an M1 variant of the Thompson. The design of the real M1s made this impossible, but in gaming it's done for the rule of cool to help balance the weapon or compensate for an otherwise small magazine like a 20 round stick. In reality, the Thompson's fire rate was also much higher than that of the MP40 or Sten, and in theory the 45 ACP would provide more stopping power than those 9mm SMGs. However, it has been common to see the Thompson's damage nerfed below these weapons for the sake of multiplayer balance. It could be controllable in one game and suffer brutal recall in another, which can leave a lot of virtual Thompsons overlooked or outclassed. 
I remember in Battlefield 5, the weapon's slower time to kill, recoil and small 20 round magazine made it a challenge to use. But myself and other players pushed through to unlock that 50 round drum and become a hip firing powerhouse. But even outside of the realms of 1920 Chicago or the front lines of World War II, the Thompson has made a few surprise appearances in games that you might not expect it, like seeing an old friend that shoots 45 ACP. The Thompson's design cues can evoke an expectation within players as to how the weapon may perform. That while sci-fi or even post-apocalyptic, the weapon should still feel like a Thompson. Gunman style! <laughs> Fallout 4 features a Thompson mashup that is frequently found in the hands of the Mafia-style Triggermen, while Fallout New Vegas features a post-apocalyptic energy version of the weapon, with the drum actually housing a series of capacitors that allow the weapon to fire continuously, which is a nice nod to the high rates of fire and capacity of the Chicago typewriter. And even the tactical future isn't immune to just how much player recognition the Thompson has, as Call of Duty Advanced Warfare's ASM-1 is essentially just a futuristic Thompson, which can even be equipped with a 1921-style foregrip and sci-fi drum magazine. And of course, it's one of the weapons that makes up the heart of the Colonial Marine M41A pulse rifle. For more on that story, you can check out our loadout episode all about that iconic sci-fi weapon. The Thompson submachine gun has had a fascinating history, split between its life as a gangster's gun and an iconic World War II SMG. And over the years, both versions have made indelible marks on our pop culture. It is interesting to think that, you know, that the Thompson started out with the best of intentions, you know, it was going to be a government weapon, a military weapon, weapon for the good guys, got subverted into a, a criminal weapon in, in two different ways, essentially, and then it's sort of reclaimed, it gets reclaimed as a military weapon in the Second World War, and we have just as much, if not more, images like commando comics, movies, whatever, of the heroic GI or the, the commando. You're, you've got at least a, a balance here between the bad guys and the good guys. There's always this duality to the Thompson, all the way through to the present day, but I think because we don't have the bad guys using them in the present day, and World War II is, is such a touchstone for everybody, I think it has been reclaimed as the sort of good guys vintage firearm. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode of Loadout. If you enjoyed another trip down memory lane with one of pop culture's more historic firearms, do let us know in the comments or find me across social media at Irregular Dave. And of course, make sure to check out some of our other episodes of Loadout, as well as our Firearms Expert React series, where we show Jonathan Ferguson a host of gaming guns. Subscribe for more as we have plenty of Loadout to come. And once again, thank you for watching.